Okay. Was, uh, we're, we're off and running, and uh, we're gonna bring up our next guest because I went over. So please welcome to the stage Poppy Gustafsson from Dark Trace and our moderator, Natasha Lomas. Cyber security firm Dark Trace is one of the UK's most exciting and fast growing startups, and perhaps also one of the most mysterious. Poppy, um, there's a perception that some of the top spies in the country got together to create this company. What's the story there? And tell us what exactly it is that Dark Trace does. So, the spark of the idea that was to become Darktrace started from a group of mathematicians at the University of Cambridge that were trying to use machine learning to teach a computer to have a sense of self. They came together with some experts from government intelligence agencies, so such as GCHQ and MI5, who believed that this mathematics could be used against the problem of cybersecurity. So traditionally, up until this point, cybersecurity had been all been about defining what a threat looked like. So it's by saying, Oh, uh, this company's experienced this attack. How would I identify if that same attack occurred in my network? So it's all about looking outwards at the threat and trying to predefine it. So instead, Darktrace took a fundamentally different approach and instead said, OK, what happens if we try and know what a network looks like, what your own internal network looks like? And then if you know what that normal pattern of life looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, you can identify when that behavior changes, which could be a symptom of an attack. And that was the sort of very starting idea that was um, to become Dark Trace. So you sort of did the, the maths research come first, and then you sort of got together with the spies? W which way round was it? it? It was exactly that. So first of all, it was the maths and the machine learning that was talking about how to teach a computer to understand itself. And then it was the, um, the experts from, from government intelligence agencies that thought, oh, this maths could be applied to the problem of cybersecurity. I mean, machine learning can be applied to sort of any number of industries, and um, luckily this was the right time for cybersecurity, and that was created a product that's really taken off, and as a consequence, we've seen some fantastic growth over the last three years. Indeed, indeed. There w I'm kind of interested in what the spies specifically brought. I mean, was there an element that the, the technology, that the product was inspired in a way by how the spy agencies had kind of used digital surveillance techniques to track targets, for instance? No, I think it was more that these guys had a, a deep understanding of the problem, and they could see from their experience that this was a problem that was not going away, um, especially because constantly we're hearing about attacks. Yeah. They were realizing that attacks were becoming inevitable, and yet people or businesses were still very much focused on securing the boundaries. And what they were saying is that even the attacks that people are suffering today are from vulnerabilities that were discovered 10 or so years ago, and nothing seems to be moving forward in terms of finding a way to protect these companies. So those um, people from former experts from government intelligence agencies, they were complete, they understood the problem and the scale of it in a way that perhaps is being understood more today, but at that point was not quite so. So they were kind of, they had a real sense of frustration in a way. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The industry wasn't doing good enough. It wasn't good enough. ahead at yeah. a rate that was fast enough that to was be able to keep up with the attackers. <laughs> so it's a crack team of mathematicians and spies. Mathematicians Excellent. and spies. Yes. <laughs> You're going to take over the world. <laughs> um, for the record, can you confirm who all of the co-founders are? Because I've yet to find a comprehensive list online. I know you are one. Uh, yes, yes. So if you think about it, so there's three teams of people. So you've got your mathematicians. Yeah. And he's now one of our, C our CTO, who, who sort of runs the technology side of the product. And then you've got the um, government intelligence agency, so um, they make up our uh, director of uh, technology and our commercial lead. And then also um, Invoke Capital was our uh, main initial investor. Yeah. And they dropped in some of the management team from their side. So they were able to help sort of encourage the company and um, bring the product to market by dropping in some people that were experiencing growing companies from very small companies to to huge multi-billion uh, dollar companies, and they took care of the, a lot of the sort of administrative and support side of things in the early days. So there's maybe sort of four or five co-founders in this company? Yes, yes, it's quite a, a collaborative team of people. Can we have a list of names? I'm, I'm intrigued. So you're one, I think Jack yes. is one. Jack Stockdale, um, Nick Trim, Dave Palmer. I'd say they're the, the, they're the key. Okay, 
Good. Well, good to get that on the record. I'm glad. <laughs> and how many are ex spies, just for the record as well? Oh, <laughs> they would never forgive me if they I wouldn't missing out their names on here. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, again, with the spies, I'll, I'll, I'll stop with the spies at some point. But I mean, you were created in a way with with some with some of the uh, intelligence agencies' help. Are you, is your technology working for the intelligence agencies now? No, we, we work with a wide range of uh, private and public sector, but we're in no way at attached to no. the government intelligence agency. This is a completely independent company. And we do support um, public sector. Um, we, we've got some work uh, across the UK and abroad, helping them sort of protect their own internal networks and things, but no, yep. we're not affiliated in any way. So. Can you lay out um, how your security approach exactly is sort of different to kind of everything else on the market? Because it it's a very transformative technology, and this is why you've, you've drawn out this, this impressive growth, right? Yeah, exactly. So at the core of Darktrace, we've got um, machine learning. So what it does is it models a normal pattern of life for a network. So an analogy that we often use is the human immune system. So our product is called the enterprise immune system. And the reason that we use that is that our immune system, it's a, you know, it's a single most important thing that's allowed us to move from living in small uh, groups to cities of millions. And it means that we can operate in a world where germs and bacteria can attack us at any time. And that same analogy works for the dark trace enterprise immune system. So at its core, it's a complex and incredible system that has an innate sense of self. So that sense of self allows you to identify other even if the other's in the form of a virus or bacteria that our bodies have never seen before. Mm. And then we can then adapt, mount a defense, and write the code of that defense into the immunological memory. So Dark Trace replicates this sort of human immune system um, and sits at a network level and mo monitors the normal pattern of life for each and every device on your network. And then if that pattern changes, it will flag that change to you in real time. Is there anything that this sort of technology um, can't catch and, and might miss? It's, I mean, it sounds very adaptable, but perhaps there are perhaps there's certain, still certain limitations. I mean, we'll always say that any sort of good boundary um, protection is always good part of good sort of network hygiene. So you're always still going to need all your firewalls and um, all your perimeter defense. But if an insider wants to get, on, if someone wants to get on your network, they will get on your network. Mm. So assume a breach, basically, is, is, the, is the philosophy. Exactly. And often, once an insider gets in your network, their um, behaviors and their attack vectors will be sort of slow and low. Sort of, They'll be gently tra traversing through the network, seeing what they can access and what they can't access. And it's those low, sort of quiet behaviors that Dark Trace will pick up and identify. Mm. Can you give us some examples of some of the kind of most creative hacks that you've oh, encountered? Yeah. I mean, there must be so many. <laughs> it's a brilliant place to work. It's a little bit like working inside a John le Carre novel. <laughs> so some of my favorite ones uh, we had. So as part of our business model, we'll go in and demonstrate the software working within a customer environment. And we had this one example that was a luxury goods manufacturer. And they obviously, physical security was very, very important for these guys. They had some beautiful clothes and these amazing warehouses. And um, in order to protect the clothes, they were using biometric finger scanners at each of the entrance to the warehouses. Right. Uh, because they found that the plastic swipe cards would get stolen or passed on to their mates and so on and so forth. So they got these biometric scanners. And we came in to demonstrate the software. And what we noticed um, was that the biometric scanners, one of them had been left slightly more exposed to the internet than it should have, oh. which meant someone had gained access to the network and not only downloaded all of the fingerprints of all of the employees from their entire network. They weren't encrypted. But then had re-uploaded a whole load of new fingerprints. Amazing. Including <laughs> their own fingerprints, presumably to then be able to gain access to the warehouse. Wow. Um, what I really love about this story is probably one of the very few instances of a criminal attack where the criminal has given their fingerprints, given their fingerprints. in advance <laughs> of committing the crime. Amazing. <laughs> That sounds like that must have been an insider, because then they would, in order to use this, they would have then had to be a member of staff to kind of go in and well, put a fingerprint and take by off. By virtue of the fact that you know they put and all fingerprints up, they could have just been, they've just, they've basically changed the integrity of the data that the company was holding, right. and used it to their advantage. 
say. Incredible, very creative. So you must see all sorts of interesting, <laughs> interesting attacks like that. Um, with the, the, the security approach that you take being kind of so different to a lot of the market, have you encountered any hesitation from corporates to adopt this? Do you really have to go and, pr and prove it first? Um, a lot of people will go in and say, oh, I've got all the best um, antivirus and I, I, you're not going to find anything. I don't have a need for dark trace. I don't have, I'm, I'm fine, I'm, it's, everything's okay. And we'll go in and do a proof of value where we say, oh, we'll just let the, let's just go in and see if we find anything. And they'll be thinking, oh, no, you won't. And we find something that someone doesn't want to see in 80% of the time that we go in and do these proof of values. So mm -hmm. it really is a significant eye-opening point for the people when they see what we have discovered. And that's a consequence in part to the fact that networks today are growing so quickly. I don't think there's... Any, any business out there that thought, if I was building my network from scratch today, this is exactly how I'd want it to be. Mm. Often networks evolve through acquisition or geographical expansion, which means that people can't sort of wrap their arms around a network in the way that they used to. They can't visualize it all and know what's all what's going on. Mm. So I think ha going in and dark trace, showing them what their network looks like and the vulnerabilities in real time is a real eye-opening moment for them. Mm. And you cover um, all sorts of different sectors uh, and kind of companies. There's a big broad range here, isn't there? Absolutely. So we see a slight bias towards financial institutions. Mm. And I think that's more of a consequence that um, banks and so on and so forth are in the habit of they've, they've got data there that people want to protect and they're in the use and mindset of protecting that data. So they're a little bit more ahead of the curve. But we really do cover every vert vertical. So got a chocolate factory, which is one of my personal <laughs> favorites. Nice one to visit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a law firm, retail, manufacturing, um, biomedicals, you name it. I think um, you have some critical infrastructure kind of companies as well, sort of energy companies. Is, is terrorism a concern for any of your customers? I mean, there can be some attacks concern. I mean, if you run, a, if you run an electrical company, there's a huge, and it's very, very critical for the country. I mean, that could be a target, right? So maybe that's, there are certain customers that have that kind of concern? I think one of their main concerns and one of their main driving factors is maintaining the integrity of the data. Right. And also the operational functionality. So they need, this data needs to be accessible and it needs to be there protecting our critical national infrastructure, be it power or oil or whatever. They need to have that data and it needs to be trusted upon. Um, and I think one of the, whilst we're not seeing it today, I think one of the you know, potential future threats in cyber will be um, what we're referring to as trust attacks. Mm. So this could be where an attacker, instead of trying to steal information that's financially valuable to them, it could be to influence strategic decisions within a business. So for example, if you are in an oil and gas industry um, and you are an attacker that's trying to sort of disrupt that business, what better way than to go in and change subtly some of the data within that network? Mm. Now that could be things like where to drill for oil. If you could find a way of um, doing the, uh, the oil feeds or something that says the, uh, the sensors which say where you should be drilling for oil and you're allowed to subtly change that data that said two meters to the left, then potentially the whole strategic uh, decision making of that business could you know, no longer be trusted. Mm. So I think that's one of the future things that they're more interested in is maintaining the integrity of that data that they retain within their network and also making sure that it's continually available and that those critical infrastructures can be kept operational. Right, that makes sense. I think um, you've, you, you do, um, so you, you have the AI side on the, the defense. Yeah. What about when you, an attack comes in, can you actually automate mitigating that attack as well? Yes. So we've got quite an exciting new development in which, we've, um, which we've moved. So and Dark Trace up until now has all been about identifying attacks. So we will um, look for sort of weak indicators and changes in behavior in a network which could be indicative of an attack and we'll flag that attack to you. Mm. And now what we've developed is Antigena, which is our latest product. And what that will do is actually take action based on that attack. So for example, Ransomware. So ransomware is in a form of attack where an attacker will gain access to your network and then very speedily just start encrypting the data as fast as it can and then extorting the business for money to be able to unencrypt and gain access to that data. Mm. 
Uh, so rather than a sort of quiet, stealthy attack, ransomware really is your sort of s smash and grab, and it <laughs> happens very, very fast. And if you've only got a nine to five security team, they, and they come in on Monday morning and the attacks happened on Saturday, like Hopefully. that's it, that's game <laughs> over. So what Antigena can do is the dark trace core system can identify that threat, but then Antigena can take action off the back of that. So that could be slowing down the, the connection that they um, has been identified as anomalous or even switching it off entirely. Um, and so I think what's very important to emphasize here as well is this is not about replacing your, in, your security team, but it's simply about s s buying them time by right. reacting much faster than any human being could. Because I was going to ask about that. I mean, in the future, is it conceivable that the entire security function could be automated and you wouldn't need, you know, IT guys? <laughs> I think that's definitely, th I mean, a sort of self-healing network right. would, like, would be this ideal it's future the <laughs> I think today we're still seeing a hesitation of people wanting to be able to take, give over control of the network to a machine. It's they a still like issue. Exactly. Yeah. They still like having that human being behind it that's ultimately mm. making the decisions. And we support that. I mean, Darktrace is there to help provide the information. And it can take initial steps to prevent too much damage. But ultimately, we'd always want to be a human that can, you know, take action based on the... Uh, right the threats identified. You do also talk about the risk of um, automated AI attacks. Have you seen any of those yet? Not yet, Not no. Yet. So these are still early days. Um, I think in terms of the evolution of the threat, like I was saying before, we're still th threats that existed 10, 15 years ago, vulnerabilities, we're still seeing those. So th I think in terms of actually mitigating against those original risks, we're still not quite there. We're seeing an increase in uh, ransomware now, so that's something that is sort of grain gaining traction. But I think that future state could potentially be where artificial intelligence is used by the attackers. Uh, if we take spear phishing, for example, so mm. where you get the emails that say you've won the Nigerian lottery, click on this link and you're going to have lots of money, <laughs> <laughs> which many people do still fall for. I think artificial intelligence could end up in a position where this could be done automatically. So they be able to read your emails. And if we were corresponding, maybe you, you'd send me an email um, to say, we're meeting at this event today. A, an attacker could potentially read through these emails. It would see my calendar. It would know that I was going to be here today. It would be able to read our previous correspondence and know that we're sort of quite relaxed and informal. And it would be able to mimic that. And it would be able to appear that you were sending me an email saying, oh, looking forward to seeing you on Monday. Here is a document with the directions and then that could be, uh, contain the malware or whatever it is. So I think artificial intelligence could potentially be used to sort of increase the intelligence of that attack. Right. And do you have a sense for who might do that? Because most hackers kind of generally want a quick win, which is why ransomware is so, so kind of prevalent now. It would take a lot of time and effort and money and resource to develop an AI attack. So this might be something that governments maybe could do, rogue states maybe. Uh, I don't think governments would. No. North Korea, think, yeah. Russia. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think artificial intelligence being used on the attack side, and while we're not seeing it today, I, it is a very lucrative event for attackers. And, it, and bear in mind, this is not just about gaining access to information that independently has financial value to the yeah. customer. This is about changing strategic decisions that's made from these big companies. And if you can prevent people from trusting in the company and the data that is in there, then that can have some very you know, valuable influence for an attacker. So who's to say what their motivations would be? But it's not purely about stealing sort of financially valuable information. But you think there might be a lot of those in, in the future, these AI attacks? Quite possibly. Yeah. Quite possibly. Um, let's talk. I'm, I'm conscious of time. We don't have lots. But I want to talk a little bit about the financial side. Um, your main backer financially is, is Mike Lynch. How did he actually get involved? It was very early on. He incubated the company at, at Invoke yes. Capital, right? Yes, he did. So he also, his, he's got a PhD in mathematics. And so he's very closely tied still to the University of Cambridge and is aware of a lot of the um, brilliant maths that's coming out of there. Um, and he, the government intelligence agency, the ex-boots basically, they knew 
they had this brilliant idea for cyber and they knew that they needed a fundamentally different approach and they knew that mathematics was the answer, but they needed to be connected to the right mathematicians in the right time that were doing this. And so they came to Mike and said, we've got this great idea. How do we make this happen? And it was him that brought together the meeting of minds and was able, obviously, to <sighs> sort of commercially say, you know, this is a great way to run a business. And, mm. it's and like you, you did that. take, you have taken some additional investment, but I think you kind of did, you didn't need to necessarily because Mike Lynch's fund is obviously very large. Why did you take some additional investors? Yeah, we've uh, do, done two further funding rounds. Um, and each of our investors brings something different. So it's very much um, not just about the financial side, but also strategically they've been very helpful. Mm. And that could be things from introducing us into new verticals and customers. We've uh, took strategic investment as well that helped us uh, expand into Asia with some of the relationships that they've got there. So it's, it's not just the investment for the financial side. It's also strategically they've been able to you know, give us a much wider range and access than perhaps just one investor could. Mm. So how much have you raised now? It's, I think it's over 500 million? No, no 500 million valuation. valuation. Yes, <laughs> 90 million. And 90 million raised. Should we expect an IPO in 2017? Oh, there's, <laughs> no, there's no immediate plans for, we just focus on making sure that we continue to grow the business at the fantastic the rate that we've seen to date. So are there specific things that need to happen before you'd be in a position to feel comfortable? So in terms of what else before you could go public? Are there key goals? What are the kind of key things there's, that you need to have? There's no plans to be going public or anything of that sort on the immediate horizon. Um, our focus is very much just about trying to grow as quickly as we can and bringing people on board to serve the massive demands out there for Dark Traces Enterprise Immune System. All right, I'm conscious I'm over time, we're out of time, but lovely to speak to you, Poppy. Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank <laughs> you.